Hello, and welcome back to Voices of the Great War. I'm Liz Watson. Today we're going to be reading some more letters from the Brown family. If you remember Edward Brown, he is a soldier stationed in France during World War I, and most of his letters that he writes home are to his brother William in Maryland. Our very first letter that we have today was written January 27th, 1918, and this is that letter. You can see it's written on that YMCA stationery. And it is, it's actually four pages long, so it's kind of a long letter. And it reads, Dear Brother, Our first bunch of mail came in yesterday, and while they were not very many, it has helped us to believe that the jinx has been broken. And at least that puts us in better spirits. I had about reached the conclusion that you had forgotten me. When your letter comes stealing along and now happiness reigns supreme, can you imagine the feeling of a fellow miles and miles away from home with hardly a source of communication? Even a postcard at times is like a straw to a drowning man and looks mighty big if it only expresses best regards. No doubt I have emphasized many times in my letters of the cloudy and rainy conditions of this country. You can readily realize how gloomy the days are. I imagine when I get home again, I'll become an ardent advisor of old Sal. Up to the present time, only one of the boxes have reached me. I'm sure the others will come struggling along one of these days. I wish you could have seen how I enjoyed the peaches, pineapple, etc. I only regret that you couldn't help me eat it. The YMCA is doing splendid work, yet they are handicapped due to the congested conditions of the railroads, which are holding up supplies. We are situated here at the present time where it is practically impossible to spend our nights at the Y. We must be in bed when taps is sounded and that's pretty early. They do not have any entertainment over here at the Y, so the boys at home are enjoying the things while, they, while the enjoying is good. And I certainly would take advantage of it too. Did you say bath? Why, we received our first real bath in months last week. Before that, we used a bucket. The bathroom is inside of a barn. A fellow outside turns the crank and at intervals, warm water falls. We will get a bath every week. Thursday being our day. Everyone is looked at closely for any signs of lice before entering. If any are found, all of his clothes are thrown in a boiler and steamed. We have been very lucky thus far. I heard from Settle and everything is okay. That cotton money comes in very good. It seems as if Baltimore suffers more from fires than any other town. I imagine they would put double guards on the factories. Well, must close for the time being. I hope this finds Florence and the kids in splendid health and with my best regards, your brother, Edward Brown, 167th Infantry, 42nd Division, AEF. So we can see from Edward's letter that um, he's actually some interesting things. He's finally going to take a bath in uh, what seems like a very long time. So, um, and yes, that was the way of things. It, it would be sometimes of weeks to months before the boys got, you know, what, what they were used to as baths back home, you know, showers. Even some of the um, more modern places did have um, some showers at that time. So it was probably, a, um, I imagine, so refreshing to finally, to finally have a real, a real bath after months of not being able to have anything more than a bucket to kind of, you know, wash yourself with. Um, so that we got to learn. He also received some mail, which is also good. And just like with Odo, we can see in this letter how vital the the correspondence was to to these boys at the time. You know, all, they just they thirsted for it. And he even says, Edward even says, like a drowning man with just a straw. Even a postcard is that precious that. Um, it's just, just to hear that something, anything to know that they hadn't been forgotten and that their family was okay. I mean, it was just, it was so essential. And he, it seems like he also got to enjoy a box that had maybe some, some food in it. So that that was a, a highlight for him. So our next letter actually is from March. So we're moving on a little bit. So this is our next letter that Edward wrote to his brother, William. And it's also written on that YMCA stationery. And it is a little bit shorter. It's actually only really two pages long. And it's dated March 1st, 1918. Dear brother, it has been some time since I have written you, 
not through negligence. Mother has no doubt informed you that it was impossible to write due to restrictions. We left our last place Monday afternoon and instead of hiking, we rode in our new ambulances. It rained that day and every day since. We are having ideal March weather for it has been snowing all day. It brings back memories of March 4th when, the, when President Taft was inaugurated. The mud is awful here at the present time, but luckily we have our boots. We came through towns which had been practically destroyed and on the walls and other towns were hundreds of holes. And this was from shrapnel and rifle fire. I went up to a pretty good sized town Wednesday and I saw quite a few buildings which had been destroyed by artillery fire. When we came over, there is one thing in particular which attracted our attention more forcefully than anything else. Along the woods on both sides were hundreds of graves of French soldiers buried right where they fell and which was at one time no man's land. On each mound was a small cross and a French flag. Most of this territory was at the time in the hands of the Germans. We had inspection of our gas masks this morning for tomorrow we go to the trenches. We are in a zone where we must wear our masks at all times. Don't let anything worry mother for the chances are good that most of us will come back safely. Give my best regards to Florence, the children, and in fact, give them every day. With my best regards, your brother, Edward Brown, 167th Infantry, 42nd Division, AEF. So this letter definitely has, uh, I think, a much more different tone than Edward's other letters, um, and understandably so. Um, on their march, they did pass hundreds of graves as he wrote and it, it was it's exactly what happened um when a when the soldiers fell especially in no man's land they they were they were buried where they fell and um i'm not sure if i mentioned i think i did in maybe one of the prior episodes we did visit my husband and son and i we visited belgium and we did see some of these um, cemeteries and that's exactly how it looked you would have and they were scattered um all over flanders and you would have some that were large and had um, hundreds of crosses and others might have had, we went to one that had less than 20. And this particular cemetery, um, it, this one was located right behind somebody's house. And the crosses, you would see them, they would be grouped together. There'd be two crosses real close together, or maybe three cross, crosses, uh, they were grouped close together and then there'd be some space. So th that was, they were exactly, they were positioned exactly where the men fell. And because with no man's land, if a man fell on no man's land, if there, and obviously if there's fighting going on, there was no way sometimes to retrieve that body. And unfortunately that body did, did stay in no man's land for in quite some time. And it, that was just an unfortunate circumstance um, of that, of World War One, where those bodies unfortunately were just left where they fell, where they fell. Um, I do have some other things. Um, he also mentioned, Edward, in the letter, that they, they're going to the trenches, and so it must have been very um, daunting, especially after, and I wonder if he maybe thought it might have been portentous, you know, to pass by those those crosses, and now, you know, the, now we're having to go into the trench, and I, I'm thinking that, I imagine that must have been kind of, um, it must have kind of maybe created a heaviness on, on him, you know, that worry. And you can even hear it in the letter, you know, give my best regards to Florence and the kids, um, not just now, but, but please keep on doing so. So he is, I think he does sound like he is, you know, he's afraid um, and, and understand, understandably so. I mean, he wouldn't be. Um, he does mention also that where they're going, that they're required to wear their gas masks all the time. Um, I have shown this on a prior episode and it was with the, um, when we were talking about the Eckert family, but it is actually a gas mask, but I just wanted to bring it back out just to kind of remind everybody of what this looked like. So, you know, this is our, this is our gas mask. You know, you'd have the eyes and there's a strap for the back of the head. You can kind of see this strap here that would go on the back of the soldier's head. And it can't be a mask, it was in a bag. So the bag would hang from there. You know, the bag could hang from their shoulder here while they have the, um, you know, the main portion of it would be inside of the bag, which was, um, it's a pretty decent size 
area there. So that's kind of where the main portion sat. So here, here's that mask there. So he would have to wear, it sounds like Edward would have to wear this mask the entire time when he was in the trench and he could be in there for quite some time. They would usually, lots of times they would be in there for maybe um, anywhere from a few days to a week or maybe a couple weeks at a time before they were pulled off the line and somebody and another group was rotated in. So it could be a long time that he has to wear that mask and um, it, I, it would be hard to do, I would think, for all, you know, all the time. Another item that I have is actually, so when they did have gas attacks, attacks they somebody off, they would alert the other soldiers, um, the first sign. So somebody would be in charge of alerting those soldiers, gas is coming in. So this is an item that they would use to alert those soldiers if they saw the gas was coming in and it would just spin around and make a clacking sound just like that. So this would be an item that they would use. And we heard before in a previous letter that, um, that there was a bell, that they also used a bell to alert people that gas was coming. So there were a few different kinds of methods. Um, but I think the next, um, the next bit of time for Edward is probably going to be, it's gonna be probably a real eye opener because he hasn't from the previous letters, it doesn't sound like he's been to the trenches before. So this is gonna be probably the first time. Um, another thing that I wanted to read, and this one actually isn't, it's not from Edward, it's um, from that other soldier, um, George Simpson, that we heard about last time. And he was at the, um, the school in Princeton, and he took some more notes. He took lots of notes. And the, um, the next bit of notes that I wanted to read have to do with what would happen when um, for deceased soldiers and the protocol for deceased soldiers. And these are actually the notes that he wrote And his notes regarding care of the deceased soldier, which he would do when a, um, a soldier was deceased. So, deceased soldiers, action of company commanders on death of a man will first notify nearest relatives, second, seize effects of the soldier, third, post surgeon must report to war department on cause of the man's death. Was it in the line of duty or on misconduct? One, in times of war, a casualty list is made out. Two, if soldier meets a violent death in peacetime, a board of officers must investigate the cause of his death. Three, CO makes final statement. Four, an inventory of the soldier's effects is seized and these effects are turned over to widow or legal representative, otherwise to summary court officer. If effects are not called for in 30 days, they will be sold by the court officer and money deposited with the quartermaster. Watches, trinkets, or keepsakes will not be sold, but turned over to the adjutant general and kept for heirs. So just an interesting little bit of um, regulation there regarding what happens um, for a deceased person um, from, from George Simpson's notes there. And I know this was kind of a somber episode because there um, was a lot of talk about about um, fallen soldiers and the deceased. But um, unfortunately, um, with Edward, he is moving towards a, um, a part of his service where it is going to be, um, he's going to see quite a bit of that. Um, and we'll probably hear some more about that likely in our coming letters. So that is all for today. And thank you for joining us on Voices of the Great War. I'm Liz Watson, and until next time.